Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Road. I'm here with my guests. Ken Miola, Police Chief. And Gary Lamarill, Fire Chief. Okay, we're going to be talking about the big event coming up this, um, this weekend, the Pumpkin Fest. And um, Chief, could you tell, Chief Lamarill, <laughs> could you tell the people a little bit your involvement in the, in the Pumpkin Fest? Well, the Pumpkin Fest, uh, behind the scenes, takes quite <coughs> a bit of activity, a, a lot of planning that uh, uh, a lot of people don't see. We usually start somewhere on January or February and we start planning with a group. This year was a little different. We had uh, Let It Shine, which is a new group. So there was some educational time period that we had to spend with them to, uh, so that they understood what needed to be done. And so far, they've worked very closely with us and they've done everything that we've asked them to do. So we're looking for a good event on Saturday. What are some of the, the safety things that you require some of the organizations to do? Well, I'll talk, talk a little bit about the overall emergency services. And I think uh, Chief Miola will be able to explain some of the um, things that they've done this year to be able to help with the safety aspects also. But basically, uh, we, we look at emergency services to make sure that we have enough coverage for the downtown area and the rest of the community. As most people are aware, the traffic uh, congestion that occurs on that day can get frustrating. Um, it's frustrating for emergency services to try and get through those, those snarls to get to where we need to go, especially the police department who are on the street all the time trying to get through those, those areas. So um, we look at making sure that we've got the proper coverage, making sure that we've got the right people in the right places uh, to be able to take care of whatever occurs downtown or in the community itself. Chief, <coughs> last year the, um, with the Pumpkin Fest, last year I would say it had to be most, the most rudest, um, most probably criminalist type atmosphere of all the the pumpkin fest it seemed for some reason it kind of lost that family event um, <clears throat> and it cost a lot of people in Keene to really question whether we should have a pumpkin fest right correct it um, <clears throat> uh, last year was a very busy year for us relative to events after the pumpkin fest um, you know historically as we've gone through this the past 20 years uh, it's obviously an all-hand call for all hands on deck for our for our department. Everyone comes in to work it, and we have to draw in uh, a whole another multitude of outside agencies to help us police this thing. Um, it's it's a huge endeavor, and, and as we look at the two different pieces of it, Pumpkin Fest itself and how we man that for security, uh, and having the right amount of people in the footprint and around the perimeter of it to make sure all points of uh, ingress and egress are secured. Uh, so people can drive vehicles into them or if someone were to try to take and uh, provoke some type of attack uh, during the the pumpkin fest that we're well suited to to create some barriers to keep that from occurring so so that's an issue in and of itself to provide security for the pumpkin fest footprint and and then it's a whole different atmosphere once it's over and as we saw last year uh, in prior years as well <coughs> we've always had some partying and in, in, in large numbers of people uh, in the Winchester, Blake, Davis Street area, kind of gravitate to that area. Uh, uh, this year we have some additional personnel that we're going to be positioning earlier on in the evening to really have a, a presence right from the get-go to try to quell a lot of that behavior. And, and, and if people are going to gravitate to that area to show them that there are a number of additional officers on the street that will deal with illegal behavior or behavior that's disorderly. The um <coughs> Kind of like last year, well, this year's Pumpkin Fest will not be here, will not take place on Friday like it's done in the past. Correct. <clears throat> um, that Friday night community night that historically has always taken place is not taking place this year, which frees up some resources for the next day. Um, so uh, Let It Shine was uh, very good in working with us and in eliminating that aspect of it. Um, they felt the benefit of, of really focusing on Saturday was more important than that that Friday night issue uh, or the Friday night events that took place so it, it, it's really worked out well from our perspective as far as really focusing on one day and all the issues that will present because we really had two different kind of events that took place from Friday to Saturday and this really helps us focus on the main event. <clears throat> the um, chief for example some of the, the safety aspects <clears throat> If there's an accident or an emergency, someone say has a heart attack downtown where it's jam packed, mm -hmm. how do you react to that? Well, we have crews in the downtown area. We have, uh, they're all set up in what we call the geographic areas, which are districts. 
So in the event that we have something, depending on the location, uh, we will bring two or three crews in that are on, on foot and get into those areas to be able to take care of the patient. And then we have areas that we actually do the pickup for an ambulance transport. So they would meet us whatever location that is given. For instance, if it's on Gilbo Ave, they would meet us just outside the barrier on Gilbo Ave. And we would um, we have a four-wheel unit that we can actually put our patient on, transport them right to the ambulance, and then they can transport to the hospital. In the, in the past, have you had many emergencies or, or fire incidents during the pumpkin fest? Sure. Uh, it varies year to year. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of medical uh, issues going on. Sometimes it's a some type of a uh, chronic illness that somebody may have, diabetic emergencies or uh, asthma attacks and those types of things. Uh, and we also have trip and falls. Because the crowds are so large down there, people aren't looking down. So as the crowd kind of moves, uh, they, they may trip over a curbing. Um, some people have fallen hard enough to hit their head, knock them unconscious. Uh, and basically it's just because it's very hard to see. We're hoping this year with the uh, move, moving of the vendors, the food vendors, to a court area, we're going to open up the downtown area so that the actual foot traffic should be better this year. Uh, more visibility, I think, for the downtown merchants so that people that are walking up through there will actually see their storefronts. So I'm, we're expecting to, to see a little bit more activity for the, for the um, downtown merchants as well. You know, that goes to one of, yeah, you had the vendors, the long lines were out. And if anybody were having their kids or grandkids, it was really a pain going through, and it was right. so easy to, to lose somebody. And <clears throat> going into that, every year you must have lost children or, or lost relatives. How would you handle that? Well, every year we do have <coughs> lost children. Uh, and thankfully, at the end of the night, we, we return them all. We don't have any left over from last year, so if anyone's still looking for any, we don't have them. Um, but, uh, yeah, we have a tent specifically set up for lost children. Uh, the public address system is designed to put out announcements relative to lost children or lost family members. It's not always children that get <laughs> lost. Um, to have a collective point for them to meet back up. And uh, it's been very successful. And uh, like Gary said, he... he kind of went through the list of what they experience in the footprint every year. And uh, it's a long laundry list of things we experience as well. We've had assaults, fights, um, thefts, uh, you name it. We've probably had it within the footprint itself. Um, so it's a very active footprint with the amount of people that come in. When we're talking about literally doubling to almost tripling the population of Keene in a one square mile footprint, you know, all those issues come with it too. So um, it's been daunting at times, but I think as over the years, as, as it's evolved, uh, we critique it every year to see what we can do better, and I think with a fresh set of eyes coming in with Let It Shine, they've come in with some new thoughts and ideas, and uh, moving the food vendor was just some something simple that maybe we should have thought of years ago. We'll see how it works. We'll critique it at the end of this year, but we all think it'll work out fairly well. I live on Grove Street, so I'm kind of like in, in ground zero with people <laughs> coming back and forth. But one, maybe <clears throat> I'm looking at, maybe I'm correct, maybe I'm not. But the years that I bring, brought my grandchildren there, it seems to me that the bars up and down, any, play, any establishment that serves alcohol, <clears throat> they seem to be pretty proactive and pretty on to it, not over-serving individuals. Where last year, next to my house, I saw a, a lot of people with 24 and 30 suitcases out there drinking and then say, let's go downtown. Well, I, I think probably <clears throat> unfortunately what started out as a nice community event for families and friends uh, turned into a party weekend. I don't want to equate it to a yep. Mardi Gras mm -hmm. because I don't think it's evolved to that level, but uh, it, it's certainly a lot more people are showing up for the after party. And uh, the bars are very active. Uh, liquor enforcement sends a number of uh, officers down to help police that aspect for us because we just don't have the resources mm -hmm. to commit to that. Um, I know all the bars and the restaurants that serve alcohol are overwhelmed those days, um, but unfortunately some people like to do their drinking before, during, and after, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes problems present as a result of it. And uh, with, with the makeup of the uh, population that we have, the area of Winchester, Blake, Davis, Willow Street, now unfortunately mm -hmm. Marble Street, becomes a thoroughfare to go back and forth to bars, parties, and wherever else people are going. 
Uh, you you having a better working relationship with, with, the, with the college this year? We've always had an excellent working relationship with the college. Um, we've, we've had a liaison officer, officer there for many, many years. Um, we're always trying new and innovative things. The current college liaison officer is working extremely well with the college. The college has uh, brought some additional person, personnel on board to try to combat some of the issues we've been seeing with alcohol and binge drinking and, and poor behaviors. So they've really stepped up relative to how they deal with their student population for issues and incidents that they're committing off of campus uh, due to alcohol or, or other poor behaviors. So they've really stepped up in that respect. I think it's important to note that the relationship that not only the departments in the city of Keene have, but the amount of uh, cooperation that we get from a lot of these organizations in town, we couldn't do that. We couldn't put this event on if we didn't have that. And I think we're unique and we're lucky in that area that not only, like you said, the city departments get along so well and we all work together, that all these other organizations do the same. You know, I think the misnomer really um, is we, we try to paint the picture of the poor behavior and down around that area where it occurs on Winchester Street as all college students, and that's truly not the case. No. Uh, it, there are college students, but they're not all Keene State college students. That's one of the things they, I bring up. Yeah. You're talking about being a party destination. They come from all over. They come from all over. We've seen high school students milling around um, <clears throat> during that time period. We've seen adults milling around during that time period who have no affiliation with the college or perhaps even the city itself. So it, it really is a smorgasbord of, of people who show up. And I'm sure some just go down to watch the behavior, mm -hmm. some go down to participate, uh, and then everything in between. So it, it's, it's daunting to police. We, we think we have a plan. We have a good plan for it this year. We've planned well for it, we feel. And, and we'll have to assess it as it goes and, and at the end of it. It's kind of like that littering. If I litter, you don't think, then you start littering and you start littering and all of a sudden, who's the cause, cause of the problem? Correct. It's, we really don't try to go down there with an enforcement attitude to just arrest every violation. Obviously, uh, if we had to do that, it would pull the needed officers off the street to really police it on the whole. Um, we try to we take a very temperate approach that if somebody litters, pick it up, take it with you type of uh, enforcement action. If people are compliant and they, they move along, that's what we expect. Um, if, if they uh, are belligerent or intoxicated or have some other attitude that results in perhaps them being arrested, then we're also willing to take that as well. Um, it, it's, it, we always walk that fine line of having the crowd under control and in, in, in compliance to it totally turn into a riot on us. So we have to use common sense uh, enforcement methods to try to get the best out of people. The, um, one of the things that I saw totally different last year, one of the things that always amazed me about the Pumpkin Fest, 9, 9.30, it was almost as if um, Cinderella's pumpkin disappeared and people just came out of nowhere, cleaned everything up, and at six o'clock the next morning, it was, except for some of the stuff that was left from the city to move on right. Monday, no one knew there were even a pumpkin fest. This year, three, four, five days, you still had busted pumpkins all around Keene. I saw people taking pumpkins and just bringing them down, like you say, some of the side streets and throwing them down on Grove and Blake. Yeah, that's, that <clears throat> proves to be very hard to police, to be quite honest with you. Um, we have this um, you know, challenge of still maintaining the footprint so things can get cleaned up safely for the volunteers th that are doing that because, let's face it, Main Street is bordered by a number of bars. Um, I think the, the fact that we're ending earlier this year at 8.30, um, before probably the bars really take off for at getting 9, busy, 10 time. that um, yeah. I, I think that's a bonus, that that'll uh, be more efficient in cleaning up and that the behaviors hopefully will be uh, more tolerable. Uh, it's, it's really tough to police the throwing, smashing a pumpkin onto the street deal. Um, we do our best, we try to keep it to a bare minimum, but we're never 100% successful. So we'll see how it goes this year, we'll assess it again and adjust as needed. It seemed like yeah. last year was an aberration. Yeah, we, last year was uh, <coughs> one of the first years that we changed our pickup policy when we, when we got done with the program, and it actually worked extremely well for us in some aspects. One is getting in there earlier so we can get the cleanup started. Uh, we had a few glitches that we had to straighten out. This year, we think we got a better handle on that. We've 
adjusted the cleanup procedures. We, we were anticipating getting most of those pumpkins out of there that night so that they won't have much to do when they come back on Sunday morning. So, so part of the thing is bring it, get it, light it, light it, and then bring it back home with you. Yep. Yeah, we, it, it's definitely, you know, we don't want, we want people to be able to save their pumpkins if they can and recycle. This year here, uh, Let It Shine is trying to recycle 100% of the pumpkins. And um, a lot of years what happens is, is somebody will throw things into the pumpkin barrel that has the pumpkins and contaminates them and they're no longer able to be recycled. So there's a bigger effort this year to try and recycle as much as we can. Uh, Let It Shine program has been in contact <coughs> with Keene State College groups. Uh, you'll see that one of the trash cleanup groups is a uh, one of the um, fraternities in town. So they're getting them involved in the process and hopefully that'll also help with um, some of their behaviors. One of the things that came that happened last year was the number of individuals that ended up in the emergency room at the hospital. And a lot of them were 11, 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. way after the pumpkin fest, but the pumpkin fest got the blame for it. <clears throat> what are some of the, um, the consequences to say, if I had an 18, 19, or a 20 <clears throat> year old daughter or a, a son who ends up in the hospital with alcohol poisoning? Is it just a medical, or is it a, is it a police problem, a legal <coughs> problem? Well, I think <clears throat> given how busy we are that night, um, I think what you'll find mostly is if we come into contact with them and they're intoxicated or incapacitated, um, they, and they're underage, they, they'll be given a summons for internal possession of alcohol. So they'll have to go to a court date later on. Um, I think what you would find if they're just going, the, uh, as a parent, you bring that child to the ER, they're probably not <coughs> calling us for everyone that walks through the door. Uh, we just wouldn't have the resources to continually respond up there. Um, last year is a prime example of, of what you were kind of laying out, is Pumpkin Fest was over, cleanup was done, we had the entire area under control, and, and then shortly thereafter we had a, a serious accident up on Route 9 where two people died. Um, we were able to attribute at least one of those people at having attended Pumpkin Fest, but we really can't say that that was the cause of the accident later on. We, we know the subject w was intoxicated at the time of, of the accident, um, but we can't attribute all that behavior to Pumpkin Fest. I don't think that would be fair at all. No. I think the uh, behavior is down to The pumpkin festival itself, I think, does very well. You know, for the day's event, the actual event itself, we have some issues here and there, but nothing that we don't anticipate. Uh, I think where, where pumpkin fest gets its uh, black eye is it, it's a continuation of that, and the same people are dealing with everything that's occurring downtown and also in those other areas, especially the police department, uh, police and fire. So I, I think that's where the, a lot of that gets attributed. To go back a little bit to alcohol related issues. I know the Keene State College, if it's an underage drinking issue with alcohol or drug related issues, we get called to evaluate them. And basically I think there's a lot of liability there if that doesn't occur. We've all seen the newspapers where, you know, a subject had died in their room from alcohol poisoning or some type of an issue like that. And they don't want that liability and I don't blame them. So we go and evaluate them and if we feel that they're not um, coherent enough, then we transport them. Because part, <coughs> part of the thing was, say we're both 19 and you're totally wasted and I don't want to bring you back to the dorm and have the RA say hey there's something wrong and call the fire department mm -hmm. but then I bring you to the emergency room but I'm not your relative and you're wasted and you can't do anything it may we end up requiring a phone call either to the police or to mom and dad to get approval to be treated. That's, um, you know, that happens quite frequently regardless of whether Pumpkin Fest is mm -hmm. happening or not, to be quite honest with you, throughout the year. We get a lot of calls up to the ER relative to people who are intoxicated who they don't have anyone to turn over to. Uh, they can't find a sober adult or responsible party that could take custody of them, and so they'll call us and we'll take custody. We'll assess them. Um, if they're underage, they're likely getting a summons for internal possession of alcohol. If we can't find someone to turn them over to, then most likely they're going to Cheshire County Jail to spend the night uh, till they sober up so they're in a protected environment. And mom and dad spending an awful lot of money to send Mary or Johnny to college and the job market's really competitive. You don't want something as simple as this really to take you out of the market. No, and I, I think that's really where the college is, is hitting its stride relative to programs. 
to, to combat that binge drinking, that uh, uh, excess drinking that puts students in this position. And, and again, it's not always just college students. I, I can't yep. specify high that enough. It's, it's high school, it's adults, it's, it's a lot of people we deal with for protective custody, alcohol issues, and um, it's not just all the college population. Now, last year in that area around the college, Winchester Street, Blake and Davis, uh, during Pumpkin Fest, I think we made about 80 arrests. So I'm going to say the majority of them were for disorderly behavior, disorderly conduct, um, open containers of alcohol, um, in, in protective custody arrests. So, so but that's fairly the majority. busy. But that that's the majority. A majority. Of the population there. Correct. So if you went someplace else, you could easily say that's the majority of the population. Correct. You know, one of the things we also noted this year, and I'm sure you're aware of it because you live on the east side of town, is the the uh, additional neighborhood areas that were affected this last Pumpkin Fest, mm -hmm. which was, like you said, on the east side of Main Street. And that was um, concerning to us to see that amount of activity that continued to move down that way also. So, like I say, the police department, Kenny and, and his group, has done a great job trying to come up with a plan to handle those areas in advance so it doesn't get to that point. The, um, this will probably tick off a bunch of the Red Sox fans, but I think you probably lucky that the Red Sox are not playing in the World Series Saturday night during yes, Pumpkin Fest Yes, that, that has presented issues and concerns for us. And as a Yankee fan, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm okay with that. I <laughs> uh, can't believe uh, you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, but, um, it's his professional opinion. He's yeah. worried about the protection of the city. <laughs> but, but that has presented problems and concerns for <clears throat> us in the past. I mean, years ago when, when the Red Sox were really hitting their stride and, and, and were a top team, um, you, you know, we dealt with a lot of issues around the college because of because of that and and then it coincided with pumpkin fest as they moved it up to try to get, take advantage of the nicer weather and, and and it really was concerning to us and, and thankfully we haven't had to you know tackle both those issues uh, yet thankful to the yankees right yes the yankees are helping us out this year <laughs> i'm not going to say that <laughs> another one parking i see that the, um, the ladies have already gone out and put on the different parking areas <coughs> over here. Some of the locals, you explain to the locals why they can't park around their house, especially on the east side? Well, I, I think after 20 years <laughs> of doing <laughs> this, I think people truly understand yeah. why they can't park there. If you've experienced it one year, you get a, a great sense of why you can't. Uh, we do as much education, as much notice as possible. Obviously, we can't knock on every door yeah. and, and talk to every resident about it. Um, if people have questions, they certainly call. The Parking Bureau gets a lot of phone calls about a lot of parking issues. Um, it really is important to try to manage it as efficiently as possible to keep open the lanes for emergency vehicles or if that, uh, you know, once-in-a-lifetime event should happen that requires uh, us to take some dramatic action. Uh, we need to have the means to move vehicles and or people in and out safely. So um, it, it does still gets cluttered. Uh, especially as people get familiar with it coming back time, year and year, year after year, and they realize I don't have to go park down at uh, Cheshire County Fairgrounds. I can park on this side street and maybe walk three or four blocks. I think we're seeing a lot of that happening, and, and that just keep, continually expands this footprint and, and the issues that present relative to Pumpkin Fest. All manageable, but just every year we have to take another look at it and, and assess it to begin again. Yeah, because it changed. For example, Grove Street. A lot of times, Grove Street's a, a raceway. Yeah. I remember when I first lived on Grove Street, and it'd be going back, so I'd just park my car right in front of my house. And then it would definitely slow traffic down. But then when the other individual parked his car in front of his house, then traffic came to a, a screeching yes. standstill. So there'd be no way in the world that you could have people parking on some of these streets right. and ever handle any emergency. Yeah, it's, it's very, it was very difficult <coughs> there for a while. Uh, we had streets that we couldn't get a fire truck down through. So, you know, when you start um, affecting the safety of those people that are living in those neighborhoods, that was when we decided, the police department especially, decided it was time to start uh, putting no parking signs up on both of those sides of the streets to prevent that. <clears throat> to, to do a, a little change, okay, some of the things that are going on, downtown, the commons, is pretty important to Pumpkin Trust. Yep. Now you're possibly running into the um, the problem is I want to be one of the 99ers and start um, keep continue protesting against Wall Street, or I want to be another group who just want to to use. 
how, you, how do you handle possibly three or four different groups who want to use the downtown area? Well, I, I think through the permitting process that yeah. takes place for the Pumpkin Fest, Let It Shine has exclusive use of the downtown area for their purposes. Uh, now it is a public area too, yeah. so, so that's where <clears> we kind of get wires getting crossed a little bit about what's allowable and what's not allowable. Uh, and in my opinion, and, and obviously we would, work, we would work with Let It Shine to resolve issues, uh, I, I think is if, if Let It Shine is comfortable with something taking place in the footprint, then we're okay with that as long as it's not a safety issue or a violation of the law. So if, if they were to set an area aside or allow people to walk around with signs, whatever they were uh, um, excited about or, or wanted to talk about, then that would be okay with us. Um, if people were trying to occupy Central Square so that Let It Shine could not utilize it for their event, then we would obviously have to take a different tact and, and figure out what violation of the law was occurring at that point because I think under the license they get, they're granted exclusive use of the downtown public areas. Because I know on the city council where you may have a hot dog vendor or different vendors, part of their license agreement is it can be superseded for a special right. event yes. for public safety. Yes. And we've had some issues in the past couple years where uh, people who, who didn't work through the organization running Pumpkin Fest, uh, it would be Let It Shine this year, who just showed up, set up a table, and started selling goods. Mm -hmm. Then nobody had any idea mm -hmm. who they were, what they were benefiting. Um, no if, peddler's license. If the, you know, the, the health check wasn't done on, on uh, the food and how they were serving it, then we've had a couple of those issues, and we were able to just shut those down and, and explain to people that you couldn't be here without a license and move them along and explain how they could get one for the next year. The, the other problem with the, with the 99 Wall Street, um, when I went by um, <clears throat> the railroad property today, <clears throat> there's a couple of tents up there. There are people who want to start camping out in that area like they're doing in Boston and New York. Well, that, the, uh, the I, I can just tell you the tents have been removed. Um, as soon as they've been put up, we've, we've gone over and talked to the people. and There's no camping allowed on city yeah. property. I, I think uh, the first night it, it, it occurred, uh, I think it just went on everyone's radar. Um, but as soon as we became aware of it in the light of day, uh, it was addressed and, and people were moved on. And, and there was another group that wanted to set up last night in, in tent overnight and, and that wasn't allowed either. So um, you can imagine that if we allowed one, one. two, three, <coughs> how many more tents show up, that the area is not set up for that. Uh, for health and sanitary yeah, reasons yeah, alone, yeah. there's no toilet area, there's no fresh water to speak of. Um, it's, it's just not allowable in those areas on city property. So, And from another standpoint, we, we've had different complaints by individual, like for example, down Well Street, the area, <coughs> because of the noise and the mm -hmm. congestion. Overall, do we get very many complaints from the businesses or other people that reside along uh, Main Street during the Pumpkin Fest? You know, I, th I think it's probably hit or miss. I think some years we've heard some business owners upset at what's been going on, that people couldn't get to their businesses, and then we've heard others that were very ecstatic about the number of people that were. I, mean, I think we've heard account after account of how businesses have record years or record days based upon Pumpkin Fest. So I, I, th I think it's like anything else. You've got a group of people who really embrace it for what it brings to them, and I think you've got a group of people who probably don't benefit in the same manner who feel it's a hindrance to what they're trying to accomplish, too. So we, we, we hear all varying sides of it. I think you, you'll find that the downtown merchants, um, one of the things that they wanted to do is bring some of their wares out on the sidewalks. And of course, that obstructs a sidewalk. It also obstructs the egress coming out of their property. So we haven't allowed that. I think this year, again, it's going to be a lot better for the downtown merchants with the vendors over in the uh, commercial lot. So you'll actually be able to see them, you'll be able to see their property, you'll be able to walk in and, and out of it without having to fight the crowds to get to it. How far is the pumpkin? I know in some years it's going up Washington and Court, west and down Roxbury Street. Is, that, is the footprint going to be smaller or is it going to expand up to those areas? It, I think it's the same footprint yeah. as last year. Same footprint. It uh, stops right at Court in Washington, a little bit onto Roxbury. West Street, it, it goes all the way down to School Street, but that's for safety reasons and then down to the uh, roundabout. So either one of you is into pumpkin bowling? Uh, 
I don't think we're going to have time. I don't think we'll, <laughs> we'll probably be experiencing that. Last year, uh, Chief and I decided that we were going to go out and take a look because it's very difficult for us to get out and do the <coughs> walk around, especially as years have gone on. More importantly, we see it on TV now. We, we watch it on Channel 9 just to see what the crowds are doing. But we went out last year to try and take a, a quick walk down through, and that never came to fruition. It's no, just There's no quick walk. Uh, no, I think we got to... Uh, Head just of north of Main Street at the Central Square there, and and that was about it. We didn't get much further than that. There were a couple issues we had to stop and deal with, and and, and one issue evolves into three, four, five issues. So, <laughs> so we decided to go back, <laughs> <laughs> get out of there. Um, when you're talking, and this may be off a little bit, but um, dogs and, and smoking. I've seen a couple of times. <clears throat> there's one individual, won't say who would has a dog, if that dog stands up, it's probably about two or three feet higher than myself. At least I can see that dog coming. Then you've got other people that may have two or three of the little small dogs. Right. It, it's such a danger, you're not paying attention and you can easily trip over. Yeah, we, you know, dogs are not allowed in the, in the footprint and we do our best to get keep them out. Um, for as many years as we've been doing it, yeah. as many people say, oh, I didn't know I couldn't bring my dog. And, and, but you, you ha for all the reasons you, you state and, and the fact that uh, they're animals and they're not always going to get along when they come into contact with each other, you just can't allow for that situation <coughs> with the number of people and children that are, are in that footprint. We just can't allow for it. Uh, the smoking issue, we don't ban smoking, obviously, yeah. because we just can't yeah. and we don't. So that's still allowable at this point. I think, tobacco. I think one of the things we ought to mention that it's not just dogs, it's animals, animals. in general. Because we've had goats, uh, pigs, the, uh, um, walking down through the streets. So. My, um, my grandson's second uncle, he's the one who likes to walk up and down the street with the big iguana. Yep. <clears throat> well, that iguana sometimes snaps just like that. And, and even with the dogs, I've seen them where... A kid will go pet the dog and the dog will jump or you're just walking and two male dogs come and all of a sudden teeth yeah. just just yeah. like that. With the, with the crowds that we have downtown, the dogs get scared also and it's their defense mechanism. So, you know, when they get into a large crowd where they can't get their bearing of where they are, anything could set them off and that's what we're afraid of. There's so many little kids and it's face level. Uh, mm -hmm to those animals that, you know, we, we try not to have any animals downtown. And I think when you're talking about that many people and the potential for something as simple as two dogs starting to fight and scaring a crowd and, and causing mm -hmm. it to disperse, uh, you, you think you always have to work towards the lowest common denominator in these issues. And I know sometimes people don't understand that or accept that. But even though your dog might be tame and timid, we just can't allow that because then how do we exclude the other big dog that might be aggressive or, or have those tendencies? So it's, we have to look at the rule of what's safest for everybody. And, and sometimes people aren't happy with that, but that's, that's really why we have these jobs to try to make this event as safe as possible. And, and, and I can't really, you know, Gary and I sit here and we get to talk about it, but um, it's really our staffs that really put this thing together and and dot all the I's and cross all the T's. I mean, they go through every step of this, every inch of that footprint, and, and figure out the safest way to pull this off and what the pro appropriate staffing needs to be and, and, and what needs to be done to make this a safe, fam family-friendly event. So, I mean, they really should get all the accolades. We get to hear and get, sit here and talk about it, but it's really all their work throughout the year that's made this happen. And public works as well. I mean, they have a huge part of this um, in, in making sure the barricades are in place and that all of the uh, facilities that need to be in place, uh, the infrastructure gets taken care of. So they have a phenomenal responsibility as well. A lot of people don't. I know some people in Keene hate the pumpkin fest and want it to go away. Other people like the pumpkin fest and they think it's part of our tradition and it helps define <coughs> Keene. One benefit of the pumpkin fest, it brings in about a quarter of a million dollars to just for the, the local nonprofits money that we as a community can't afford because we're not putting more money mm -hmm. to the, the social services. The city, I think it's dropped from 60 to 65,000 down to about 25,000. So the people <clears throat> are having to come up with more money. But when you, you talk about the job that you guys do, but really the job of public works and everyone else, the police and firemen, but you don't do it alone. You have other people, other 
organizations that help you? Could you name some of the other ones, both police and fire, that come and help out? Well, I, I think relative to the city operation, yep. you, you have just about every department in the city touches this. Yep. I mean, the city clerk's office has a huge part of this, uh, takes all the minutes at the, the protocol meetings, processes uh, all the permits, uh, make sure all the paperwork is complete. Uh, any items for follow-up, they're making sure they're getting dispersed to the appropriate entity to do that. Uh, finance is involved. They're tracking the money and, and, and how things are going to go and, and what the budget should be and, and how it should be doled out. So uh, I think just about every aspect of the city touches this code, health enforcement, um, planning. Uh, I can't really think of any that aren't involved to some degree. Yeah, the city council, of course, is involved from the from the beginning. Um, there's a lot of outside agencies. Uh, you know, we hire in other agency, other fire departments to come in and assist us. We hire in uh, more fire trucks, more ladder trucks, more ambulances to cover the the. We currently have two stations open during normal hours, but that day we have four fire stations going. So there's definitely an increase in all the resources that we bring in to help us out. Police department bring, brings in. People from everywhere. Yeah, about seventy uh, uh, throughout the day, including our people, will probably rotate seventy officers through the footprint and through our patrols. Um, and, and I think you know we really talk about Pumpkin Fest, and, and when we talk about emergency services, it just doesn't end there because y if people think that's all where all our personnel are going and, and where they're handling responsibilities, that's just one part of it. We still have the rest oh, of the Pumpkin. city to deal with, right. so we still have to have. Uh, a certain amount of officers on patrol. Gary still has to have a fire truck and ambulance and personnel ready to respond to fires or other emergencies that occur outside of the footprint as well. So uh, we're taking the entire population, like I said earlier, doubling, tripling it in one small area, but we still have the entire population of the city to deal with outside of that footprint as well. So it can be daunting at times depending on how busy things are and depending on what occurs. The um the weather's supposed to be really good, about 60, 65 degrees, less than 10% chance of rain. you have any idea, what, guessing how many people you expect to show up? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, you know, it's hard to say year to year. I know um, in prior years they advertised it fairly heavily in, in a lot of different <laughs> venues. Um, I think Let It Shine took the position that they weren't going to do that this year. I'm not sure exactly what they've done for advertising. I don't think it's been much. <laughs> Um, so I think their, their goal, really, from all the conversations we've had with them when I've been in the room, has been to try to turn it back into a f community event uh, for Keene. Now, I don't know you ever accomplished that because of the notoriety it has. Um, I've talked to people from all over the world who've attended this thing, uh, just as I milled about over the years. So it's, you know, who knows? It's anyone's guess. We also have a competition going, as you're aware. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the more interest you get out there, the more the people are going to come. And based on what's going on, I think, with the hotels uh, being booked, uh, I think that's a good indication that we'll have some crowds. Okay, now ending the Pumpkin Fest area. We'll, give, we'll talk to Chief um, a few minutes about your new fire station. Absolutely. How's, how is that coming along? <laughs> it's coming along great. Um, we had a, we had got behind a little bit uh, with the concrete because of the rain and those types of things. Uh, we had a lot of rain this year? Yeah, we had some. <laughs> and as you're aware, the, the uh, it's the infrastructure that has to be built underground in order to hold a building that's built for seismic uh, capabilities we is just phenomenal. Here, do we? Yeah, well, <laughs> we've had a few. Yeah, just Only few. takes one. That's yeah. right. We want, it to, we want it to be standing when we do have one. <laughs> but basically, uh, th they're doing a very good job. They're on schedule, pretty well on schedule. Uh, they're still looking for a May 1st date for a substantial completion. And they're closing in the, uh, the rest of the foundation as we speak. And hopefully we'll start seeing some steel go up in a couple of weeks. And that'll be the, uh, the good part to see actual 3D instead of just a, everything level to the ground. There is two concrete towers going up right now. Uh, one is our training tower and the other is the, one of the stair towers. So you're not going to retire right after ribbon cutting, are you? No, well, one's a ribbon cutting. <laughs> you just said May 1st, right? <laughs> Actually, ribbon, we, we probably won't move in until the you know, beginning of June. And we've got some settling in to do. We've got a lot of... Uh, we still got a lot of work to do once we get the new building to get everything set up. So can't wait for it to be finished, huh? <laughs> it's a long time coming. Um, as the city <coughs> manager said the other evening, that there's been so many people that have touched this, and you know, council after council has worked on this process. So it's really good to see this 
building come together as a it's a community project it's not just for the fire department this is for the entire community uh, it's much very much needed so that you know our guys can be safe respond safely and be able to get to you know the, the incidents quicker so we're we're real excited I can't wait for it to happen um, not that we really want to leave the old building a lot of history there but we will be able to look out the window and see it every day and the purpose of this building one of the things and the, the quality of construction that you expect some of the great great grandsons and great great granddaughters of the firemen today to be working in this the new building yeah one of the things that we always say is that <clears throat> you know the building's 126 years old now that this building was built for horses and and uh, wagons you know steamers and those types of things <clears throat> And we joke that 100 years from now, they're going to be flying off the roof complaining <laughs> this station was built for motorized apparatus. So, you know, we don't know what it's going to look like in 100 years, but I can tell you that the building is being built to last, and that's great. I mean, for the amount of money that we're putting into this building, uh, compared to what it was a few years back, we actually saved money by, by waiting a little bit. So um, we'll get a good building, a good working building. It's not a Taj Mahal. It's... It's a real good building. It's a lot like the police department. It's usable. It's functional. Uh, it's new so that, you know, the employees have something to be able to safely work in. Now, Chief, you've got a new building. Going on five years. I don't know. Do we still call that new? <laughs> it's supposed to last 100 years. All right, it's new. <laughs> Until the fire station <laughs> build is new. <laughs> yeah, we're working on our fifth year now, actually, in, in our building. And, uh, you know, as designed, it's suiting our needs. And, and you know you can always look back and if you had to do over you would tweak this or change that and but you know the bones of it in, in the way it's laid out are, are super to uh, super efficient for us we, we've been using it uh, really well in the last four and a half years and adapted to it very well so people are, people got used to it I think that's the bigger piece is the community got used to it being out of the downtown and to where we are now so uh, not going out of business anytime soon. There's no been no slow of business as a result. So it, there's a few people who are not happy that you're no longer downtown, but your location seems to be working out really well. Well, I, I think with the advent of the downtown foot patrols, we initiated yep. a couple of years ago, and I think we've really picked up that slack. To be quite honest with you, while the physical building was downtown, uh, honestly, before we did the downtown foot patrols, there really wasn't much of a presence. You'd see cruisers moving back and forth through the downtown to go elsewhere. But, but not that on the ground, uh, you know, talking to people and, and having building relationships, that type of, of police work that, that we feel is important. And the other one, we, we had talked about it before, your new drug take back bin, uh, yes. almost like a phone, a mailbox down yes. there. It's actually a, a converted mailbox. mailbox. That um, uh, that was the efforts of many people, uh, Monadnock Voices for Prevention, Cheshire County, uh, was involved, uh, MADAC, a whole number other of, of coalitions that came together for this purpose. <coughs> Cheshire Medical Center was instrumental in, in, in partnering with us in, in a lot of these take back events we've done in the past and we're doing another one October 29th um, and that will probably be the last take back event we, we do because now we've got this um, box designed for uh, unused prescription medications or even over-the-counter oh. medications that people don't know what to do with. You know, as we know, prescription drugs are becoming a problem in this nation, uh, the abuse of them, that uh, to have them hanging out in your medicine cabinets is no longer acceptable when you don't need them any longer. They're falling into the hands of school children, they're uh, being sold, people are, are becoming addicted to them. Get rid of them, clean out your medical, med medicine cabinets. Um, if you have a family member who had some serious illness and they've since passed away and you don't know what to do with them, Bring them down to the police department. We've got a box that you can dump them into 24 hours a day. You don't have to talk. You don't even talk to anybody. You just go nope. in and just drop them right in. No that box. questions asked. We take uh, prescription drug med medications, vitamins, anything you just want to get out of your medicine cabinet. As long as it's not illegal drugs, we don't take that. And, and no we, syringes. We don't take syringes. No, but uh, uh, MVP, Manadnock Voices for Prevention, is actually working with the City Public Works Department to put a Sharps box up at Public, uh, Public Works, the landfill, uh, to dispose of those safely there. So that's another initiative that's coming up. So, I was looking at the research, <clears throat> and it was really scary. I think the last one was like 2008. There were more people who died of drug overdoses in the United States than traffic accidents. It's, it's pretty scary. It is. In, <clears throat> in, um, it's, it's a systemic 
problem. It, it's not just the people who are prescribed the drugs. It's, it begins in the medical profession that they're not over-prescribing what people need to get them through whatever issue they're having here. Um, I've heard stories of people who've, who've had an injury to a knee, back, or whatever, and they're given a 30 days worth of whatever painkiller, and they use about two to three days worth, and now they've got this bottle of drugs sitting in their cabinet. So uh, I, I think the medical profession is taking great strides to look at this and, and really change their practices, uh, not only from a holistic view, but uh, from an abuse view as well. And when we look at the number of pharmacy robberies we've had in this community yes. alone over the last few years, it, it's, an, uh, it, it's a problem. And be, before we finish up, I think we talked about it before, the word synergy. It was big in California because we had people say, well, I'll just take two beers, I'm not drunk, and I'll take a couple of painkillers so that'll not pop up where California changed the law. You're driving under the influence and you go, wait a minute, I'm not drunk, but I'm not have drugs. Right. Can right. you help explain it, the word synergy to uh, some of the people? Well, well I, I think synergy, <clears throat> as I understand it, is a number of things coming Come together, together to produce a better result, but in that instance that you've described, it actually deserves, uh, produces uh, a better, worse result. <laughs> <clears throat> but, but with synergy, even though you're not drunk or you're not legally under the influence, you can still be impaired driving, right? Correct, right. yes. You can be under the influence of alcohol and or drugs under the current New Hampshire law. Yeah. Do you run into problems with that, Chief, um, on some of them? No, we'd, we've seen that. I, I'm the um, the activity that we see when we go on ambulance calls and those types of things, uh, it, it's just amazing to me to see how, it's not just kids, it's adults doing this, that they don't have a clue what they're taking. Yeah, the research said between 45 and 70 have the greatest risk of dying of drug o prescription right. drug overdose because of not paying attention. But as, as the chief was saying earlier, you know, the, these kids are going into the medicine cabinet. I, I just remember seeing this, uh, the one on TV where the guys, the kid is taking and, and taking, the, well, this is for my back pain, this is for this, this is for that. And it's amazing. That's what's happening out there, that these kids don't even know what they're taking. They just, somebody's handing them a pill and they're popping it. And, it, you know, that's scary. It's scary that, that it's happening here, but it's scary it's happening, I think, in an epidemic around the United States. Yeah. There, <coughs> I think what you're seeing a lot of, too, is older, elderly folks who, who are in fixed incomes who can't afford the medications, so they're not taking it as prescribed. Right. So maybe they're taking half of one or a quarter of one to try to get them through the day when they really need to be taking the whole thing. Uh, and then when they're feeling better, they're swapping pills amongst themselves. Um, which is never a good idea. <laughs> so, but it, but it's, some of it is economically driven. Because I have some medication right on the bottle. It specifically says, do not break, do not crush, right. because it's supposed to be time-released. Right. And I just took a half a pill. How could I have a problem? Yeah. Right. Well, I want to thank both of you chiefs for being sure. here. I'm wishing you a great, happy, and safe, and no-incident pumpkin fest. Thank you. I'm sure we'll see you there. You shall see me there. And so, again, thank you for your time, and let's hope for the best. Thank I you. just wish my father a happy birthday today. Yes, no he, problem at all. Father's birthday today. Unfortunately, he has to spend it in the hospital, but he's doing well. How That's old? Good. Happy birthday. He's how, how old? 83. 83. 83 today. Okay. Well, hopefully everyone will enjoy the um, Pumpkin Fest, and I'll see you out there at the Pumpkin Fest. Maybe we'll talk to you. And so, as we say, um, I'll see you on the long road. And in the meantime, we're going to show you another clip from one of the interviews we did out at the airport with a B-17, um, World War II B-17 um, crew member. And I hope you enjoy this clip. Thank you. Your name, sir? Norwood Keeney. And where do you live? I live up in Unity, New Hampshire. Unity, New Hampshire. So yeah. it's a little south of um, Newport. So you came all the way down to see the... Oh, yes. We have a place in Richmond that we're going to end up into, but uh, this was the nearest place that the aircraft were going to be. And I noticed you have a B-24 emblem on it? Yes, that's correct. You have a connection with the B-24? Yes, I was with a 380 heavy bomb flying out of Darwin, Australia, and um, Mindoro, Philippines. And what is the difference between the, the B-17, B-24? I really don't know because I never was anywhere near a B-17. 
my first flights really were in the 24. Um, because actually what happened was I was, had the opportunity to become a, an operator, a, a radar countermeasure operator, when they um, needed operators and didn't need mechanics, which I was. <laughs> so I started flying and that was it. The, um, we've noticed that some, some of the planes like that have two um, engines, other ones have four engines. Is that the B-25 or? Uh, the 25 is the two engine. So that was That's a short correct. range? Shorter range. Shorter range. Uh, because our missions were out of where we were flying were 10, 15 hours, just about standard. <clears throat> 10, 15 hours, but we have people who complain if they have to spend six hours on a plane in comfort from Boston to L.A. Oh, well, <laughs> so be it. <laughs> I mean, that's all I can say. <clears throat> so... So that's about 10, 15 hours round trip, or is it yeah, one yeah, way? Yeah, you know? hours round trip, yep. We're leaving them, leave it in the morning very early and get back at dusk, essentially. That was basically the way it worked. And so what would be the, on the turnaround time for a mission? Well, obviously about half of it, so seven or eight, something in that hour. No, so if you, if you flew a mission today, when would you have to, and you made it back tonight, when did you have to? couple of days off or? Uh, I, was, uh, I was a radar countermeasures operator, so I didn't fly as often as um, regular crews did. I was, the, uh, I was an extra man, as it were. So when they had 10 men, they looked up and said, oh, we have 11 today. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> did you get the flight? Did you get to go in the B-24 today? Oh, yes, I've been, I've been, uh, it's gotten a little smaller, <laughs> especially, especially the Bombay walk. Maybe we didn't, maybe you didn't realize how small it was when we... <laughs> uh, all right, perhaps. <clears throat> because talking to some other people, it's kind of like when you watch the movies and 12 o'clock high, these planes look so big, but then when you go really close... Well, I'll tell you, I told, always told my wife about the big airplane I flew in. And one time we went down to Nashville at an air show, and they had these aircraft here as well as some modern-day military transports. Her comment was, big? <laughs> it wasn't that big. You know, when you compare, look at the C-130. The C-130 is called a small plane, but it makes your plane a little small. But uh, no, it, was, um, it was a very interesting experience. Um, actually, what happened is... Um, I went overseas as a mechanic, and the bomb group that we were with, originally, uh, Roosevelt had, President Roosevelt had uh, given it to, I should say given it, assigned it to the Australians to operate out of the Darwin area, because they had nothing of long range. And the bomb group I was in was training Australian crews to fly the 24. And when we moved up to Mindoro, Philippines, the only part of the Australians that went up was the radar countermeasures group, which I was a part of by then. So I was in the interesting position of being an American, working for the Australians, um, flying. So it was quite an interesting. They can be a little rowdy at times. Yeah, well, quite. <laughs> never gamble with Australians. <laughs> you say they cheat or they always no, win? No, they were good. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I want to thank you. Okay. You're and, welcome. And um, I, I appreciate you being here, and okay. I think that the viewers will appreciate it.